My goodness, are you guys going to love this one? I'll be right back. Well, hello there, Gracious Gang. It's Mike from thegraciousguest.org here with you for another episode of The Gracious Guest Show. And I'm really delighted about this one because it was a very special interview that uh, I've been hoping for for a long time, and we managed to finally work it out, namely... I invite on the show today David Rolfe, uh, and I'm going to talk more about him in just a second. But before I do, please make sure, as always, you subscribe to this video, like this content, share this content far and wide uh, with anyone that you think may benefit from it. Uh, if you're listening to the audio version, um, subscribe, like, follow, add, whatever the, the sort of version is that the podcast aggregator you use, uh, your your podcast aggregator of choice, whatever they do, right? So it's uh, iTunes, iTunes anymore? Apple Podcasts. iTunes is like old school, I guess, but it's still out there. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Stitcher. I think I'm on iHeartRadio, Spotify, all those things. So today we are talking to David Rolf, who's calling from uh, the UK. And uh, we had to push it back a little bit, so I was very grateful that he was able to join me uh, pretty late for him, um, you know, getting getting close to uh, to bedtime. But at any rate, we managed to work out this interview. David is best known, perhaps, as the BAFTA award-winning uh, uh, producer director of uh, the 1978 Silent Witness. Uh, the Silent Witness was a documentary about the Shroud of Turin that really put it on the map for a lot of people—people people who hadn't heard about the Shroud before. And uh, it was uh, just just a huge success, really. Uh, and so uh, largely because of the success of The Silent Witness and his own personal experience making that film, which brought him from a sort of uh, atheistic, even in some cases, um, uh, perhaps even anti-Christian background uh, into an actual uh, conversion to Christianity. And David has dedicated really the rest of uh, his life in large part to helping to uh, dig into the Shroud even more, to spread word about the Shroud, and to produce a very uh, brand new and, and uh, uh, awesome documentary I've been able to see just a few weeks ago called Who Can He Be? And so uh, I mentioned this in the interview, but you can check the show notes below for more information about David Rolf for the film Who Can He Be? which we really want to make sure we spread the word about. But for now, let's jump right into this uh, really intriguing interview with David himself joining me from the United Kingdom. Check it out. All right, David Rolf, thank you so very much for being my gracious guest here today. That's a great pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Uh, I just wanted to basically dive right in here. And, and since, you know, we uh, have you joining us today with, with such a uh, sort of compelling shroud experience uh, that, that you've had, a little bit of which I know about, but the, most of it I don't, I'm sure. But uh, I would love to just invite you to be able to share whatever you want to share about your own background, especially as it pertains to uh, where the shroud kind of entered your life and uh, and how, how you sort of got into this work in the first place. Well, I, I guess if I really go, go back a long way, um, the shroud, as you know, is in Turin and it's Italian. Um, it, it's the shroud is in Italian, but it's kept in Turin. Sure. Uh, when I was ten years old, my father got a job um, in Milan for a year, so uh, we went over there for a year. And um, at that age, and I went and I went to a very it, it, a, a, a school which where Italian was obviously very important, and so I got immersed into Italian culture when I was about 10 years old. And that was a, that turned out when it, in relation to the Shroud to be quite, quite a useful thing. Um, mm. But then I, uh, when in uh, the rest of my life, um, the Shroud was the most unlikely thing mm. for me to get in, uh, interested in because I wasn't at all religious. Okay. I mean, I had a kind of, in this country, um, a C of E, Church of England, is, mm -hmm. and I, th I was sent to Sunday school mostly, I think, because it gave an opportunity for my parents to have some time together on a Sunday afternoon. Um, <laughs> they weren't particularly religious. Okay. Um, but I had a, a, a sort of uh, 
a, a normal uh, awareness. I was in a Boy Scout too, and of course we okay. had a, a monthly church parade. So I'd had some exposure to the church, but um, I have to say I wasn't at all, um, uh, had, had no religious feelings. There was no great religious mm. tradition in my family. Um, okay. But I became, I, 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 I had, I had a long-standing interest in photography, um, and so when it when it came to looking for a career, I, I I went into that, and then that was a natural progression. Then into film, I went to the London Film School back in 1976 and graduated in 1978 with honours from the London Film School. But back in those days, I mean, there were only two TV stations in the UK. I mean, it's hard to imagine now. We must have 700, but yeah, there, were only two, there, there were only two channels. It was very difficult to get work um, in, in, even though I graduated with honours from the London Film School and the unions controlled a lot of it too. So there were sure, yeah. bar barriers to getting employment. But I did manage, mm. I, I managed to, to get work making industrial films for oil companies and that sort of thing. But ultimately, they weren't particularly satisfying. Mm. So I thought, what, what do I do? I had, a, I'd start, and again, because you couldn't get a job, I'd had to start my own small company. Okay. Um, and like I said, I got a little bit fed up with the kind of work I was doing. I thought, what can I do? So I, and I couldn't afford to advertise, but I sent out a press release to all of the uh, regional newspapers in the UK and said, independent producer looking for ideas for films. Hmm. And I don't know what I can show you, but anyway, I was deluged. I mean, there, there, were, there <laughs> were people up and down. I mean, I had a stack like wow. this of, uh, of people sending me ideas for films. And I have to say, most of them didn't really inspire me, but out of uh, out of one envelope when I picked it up was the image on the face of the shroud. I'd never seen this before. Mm. And it was sent to me by a then relatively young Oxford graduate history of art, Ian Wilson. Um, mm -hmm. And he had, had been told about my advert and uh, he sent me this picture of the Shroud of Turin. Now, as I told you, I was interested in photography. I spent a lot of right. time, a lot of time in dark rooms making my own prints and so on. And sure. I was sent the positive and the negative image of the shroud. And uh, as I say, having spent a lot of time in dark rooms with negatives, I looked at this, this what was clearly, when you look at the shroud itself, something mm -hmm. was very hard really to understand visually. Right until you saw it in the negative. Um, right. Which, of course, right. is actually the positive, yes, as we now know with the show. So I was absolutely intrigued by this thing. And, 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 did, and did you I notice, know just, it, did, well, I just want to ask real quick, did you know if just seeing the image, was it clear at first, or had you seen that this was an image of a, of a face on a cloth, or did, did you just think this was a photograph? I knew, I, I knew nothing about it except ah, okay. Ian Wilson... He said, this is something called the Shroud of Turin. Wow. Hmm. And it's and it purports to be an image of Christ. Hmm. Um, and he sent me both the positive and the negative image. And it was wow. It was that positive and the fact that it's medieval well, at least medieval cloth. Yeah. Yeah. Had this characteristic that I thought, there's gotta be a film in there somewhere. I didn't know what it was gonna be. <laughs> And I right. certainly didn't think at that time that it was that it was likely to be the authentic cloth that wrapped Christ's body. As I say, I wasn't religious, but sure. I was a photographer, and I spent hours in the darkroom um, working with light. Now I don't know if you've ever done any work uh, in a in a no, no. I've I've seen it, but yes, not myself. Okay, well, basically, I mean, I've got a a lamp here. Yeah. Uh, it's lighting me up here um and you can see this side of my face now is brighter than than that side um, sure. i just directed it at me more um yeah light is energy basically right light i mean what's coming out of there is a form of energy 
And when you're working with it in the darkroom, you can see where it falls off. You know, it graduates. Yes. You know, there's no, you know, as, as it gets further away, it's graduated. Right. And this image on the cloth from negative. Now, at that time, the fact that the shroud is encoded with three dimensional information wasn't known about it. Right. Um, it was positive or negative. But when I looked at it, I had the same, I could see how the light was falling off it so that it, although it was a two dimensional image, it looked like a real product of energy, which mm -hmm. you get from an enlarger, and the way that it falls off when you're actually making a print in a dark room. And that, sure. and that was very impressive. And, and you, you so could I see thought, that just from your experience working with photography, yeah, just right, up, right off the bat. The image spoke to me yeah. um, from a technical point of view. Um, hmm. And I... I don't, th uh, well, even though I wasn't religious, there is something intrinsically about the image too, because, which I can now much more easy for me to, uh, for me to relate to. Now this is on my office wall. Mm -hmm. And you sure. obviously know what this is. I, I have the same one up here. Mine's a little smaller. <laughs> exactly. I think this is one of Barry Schwartz's. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. There was also something intrinsically about this image. This is obviously just the face, mm. but the the body had the most horrendous wounds, um, mm. which, as the more and more I got into it, I could see it was could only be explained by a crucifixion, and yet this, yeah. This image in death somehow seemed to transcend it somehow. There was, you know, you'd expect, you know, some sort of hideously contorted face that had gone right. through that. But something about that image. Um, and the other thing, of course, is it's very Jewish. I mean, mm. is the image, you know, that he, it's a very Jewish face. Mm -hmm. And we know for certain one thing we know about Jesus was he was Jewish, right? Um, and so there were so many things that 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 sprung out of that image that gave me the confidence to go forward. Um, I I I did what any independent producer does and and took it to the the two networks we had in the in the UK then the independent mm -hmm. ITV network and BBC. Said no one's going to be interested in this in religious yeah. work. It's just, you know, go away. And, right. and anyway, who right. are you? Anyway? <laughs> don't, yeah, don't bother. Right? Yes. <laughs> um, and I so it took a while. And, and Ian Wilson's suggestion, he said, "Well, there's one person. There's one person who seems to be key to the, the shroud of Turin, and that's a priest in New York. And this was Father Peter Rinaldi." Hmm. And but he was he was an altar boy in Turin, um, and he'd gone like so many did to America, and he had a parish. He would become a parish priest in a place called Esopus, which is in north of New York, in New York, just north mm -hmm. of New York. And he had become, if you like, the fulcrum for anything to do with the Shroud of Turin. And the other thing you have to remember is that well, there was no internet in those days. Right. So what I had was this image that Ian Wilson had sent to me. He, his, he had graduated from Oxford in the history of art. And what had interested him um, was um, in artistic uh, depictions of Jesus. Mm. There are lots of diverse um, images of him right up until the 6th century. Right. And then from that moment right. on, we have the classical look of Jesus that we all know. And he traced mm -hmm. this back to the discovery um, of a cloth in Edessa, which is uh, in, in southern Turkey, but mm -hmm. just over the border um, on the routes from, from Israel. 
And uh, this um, this uh, image of Edessa, mm -hmm. the, the rediscovery of this in the sixth century, uh, seems to have been uh, the origin of what we now know as as this classic likeness, right? Yeah, of Jesus. That's how and some before, some of those key features, like the like the the the, the part in the middle and the longer hair and the beard, just some of the things right. we take for granted. But you don't see a lot of those same features in art yeah. before that. And before the six, obviously the first Christian. I mean, not the first Christians, but Christianity took root in Rome, right? And and the Romans were shaved and they had short mm -hmm. hair, so. They, they, they when they depicted Jesus because they, they they made him look beardless and and, right. and made him look like a Roman. But suddenly, right. from the sixth century on, that becomes the the image of of uh, the sort that that was the model for the depiction of the image of Jesus. So that was Ian sure. Wilson's historical contribution. Now. Hmm. It's, again, it's hard to imagine in, in this day and age, but there was no internet. And anyway, when he said to me, "Look, there's there is one this one person in in in, America, in New York, Rinaldi, who you should go and talk to," and initially I just wrote to him, and his first thing he said, he said to me, "Just come and see me." Now, I, <laughs> and I was in London. It was 1976. I'd never been to America. Yeah, just just hop over here. <laughs> yeah, just come and see me. And, and actually, yeah. it was a big deal for me at that time to sure. yeah. go to uh, to New York in 1976. <laughs> anyway, I got there um, and found this most charismatic. Uh, I mean, I can only describe him as a holy man. Hmm. Um, but because his position in America, he had become the center point. Anybody who was interested in the Shroud of Turin eventually made their way to him. So by okay. contacting him, he was able to introduce me to Robert Bucklin, for example, who was a forensic pathologist in Los Angeles, who had studied the wounds. He mm -hmm. was able to tell me about John Jackson and Eric Jumper, who'd done this sure. uh, remarkable discoveries with, with the, the three dimensions, um, three dimensionality. And uh, so basically, he was the key to me discovering it wasn't just this his, this historical story that Ian Wilson had sent me. There was there were multiple layers of this. But the other thing he did for me, which was again quite extraordinary, he was he introduced me. Uh, we flew to Milwaukee together, and uh, he introduced me to the heir to one of the great brewing families that had been. <laughs> Uh, established in in Milwaukee, That's and over lunch, <laughs> I was able to pitch this idea for the film, and effectively mm -hmm. walked away from that lunch with what is the equivalent today of a million dollars to oh, make wow. the film. Wow! Um, and as an independent producer, uh, I mean, it was actually three hundred and fifty thousand pounds, which in modern yeah. in modern times would be about a million a million dollars. Sure. So suddenly I had I had this idea, I had the contacts and I had the money. And uh, the film uh, was shot in 35 millimeter uh, and it won a British Academy Award. Mm. So, and it really put the shroud on the map, uh, not just for me personally, from a professional point of view, but uh, because it went all around the world. I mean, Sure. Elvis Presley and Priscilla Presley um, uh, bought the rights to the film um, really? in America. Um, unfortunately, I Elvis, didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Priscilla Presley, um, in, in her attempts to try and, you know, to get Elvis to sort of um, come off the booze and so on, had yeah. Uh, developed this interest in religion and but she um, and indeed Elvis uh, in fact in his last days uh, was reading a book about the Shroud of Turin hmm. um, anyway the um, wow. Priscilla Presley bought the film rights 
uh, she, Pat, she formed a consortium with her. Pat Boone was another person in the consortium. However, the, the, the film did not, was not a success theatrically in America. Hmm. And that, and I, and I, it was to, explained to me was that the end of the film ended with the question, who can he be? I mean, hmm. who is, who is he? Here's right. all the evidence. Who is he? right? And I don't know. I mean, you you may have a you may um, uh, have a counter view on this, but when I tried to figure out, because all over the rest of Europe the film was very successful, but in America mm -hmm. it wasn't. And I was told that Americans don't like questions; they like answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that might be the case. You know, certainly, in, I feel like 1976, you know, 77, 78. It came out in 78, correct? Silent yeah, Witness. That's right. Yeah, I think that wasn't that was that was an odd couple of years. <laughs> I think. Oh my! No, that I can see that. Actually, let, let me ask you something quick uh, with, with that, David. Too, as far as the, the 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 release of it, because I think something that, that would be good to make sure that. The uh, the viewers and listeners are are thinking of here in terms of the timeline. That's intriguing, I think, to me at least, is how all of this is happening before uh, the the Stirp team does their work and starts finding anything. You know, scientifically speaking, correct? Absolutely, Stirp had not happened at this time, right? And, and I mean, did you? I don't know if you if you even knew anything while you were making it about that being in the works or anything. I just find that very intriguing that this, the timing of all of this. Well, it, it, it wasn't in the works. Um, yeah. Uh, except for the fact that uh, Jumper and Jackson had come up with the three dimensional discovery on that. Sure. Right. The, the, the fact that the, the image was encoded with three dimensional information. Hmm. Now, Father Rinaldi being was a, um, you know, he, he was very good to me, but he was also shrewd enough to make sure that the Holy Shroud Guild of America, which he had formed, had a share of the profits from the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, indeed, um, it was the profits from the sign and witness that accrued to Father Rinaldi that became the seed money for the Stirp trip oh, to Rizzi. So they were okay. directly related. Okay. Um, it was a, oh. a hugely expensive exercise. I mean, as you know, I mean they, sure. they took a jumbo jet full of equipment ac across right. to, to, to Turin, and the the money from the from the sign and witness seeded that, and eventually they also got some other uh, funding from a donor. Hmm. So uh, the stirp was directly related to okay. the sign and witness, but it preceded it. Right. Wow. And so there's so there's so much more we could cover along the way, but I want to make sure we have plenty of time to get into uh, to this Who Can He Be film that, that you have out now, which I've been blessed to see. And is, is I want to spend uh, a good chunk of time on that. So I just maybe would ask you in the wake of the success of The Silent Witness, I guess it was just about 10 years exactly, I guess, after that, that that uh, carbon... 14 dating comes out um and so I, i'm just curious to ask you like what what was what were those days like <laughs> that's too short of a question maybe but or blunt of a question but in terms of just in the in the wake of that then you have this british museum you know uh, comes out and just just does this press conference and and uh everything i i've read about it everything i've i've you know seen about it does seem like it was just a very blunt dismissive them saying this is the end of it you know that that must have been a real well wrench in well, the works <laughs> in a sense as soon as i heard that the 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 carbon dating had been mooted as a possibility hmm. um i went to the bbc in this country and said um because of my relationship and contacts with turin i think there's a very good chance that um, I could get an exclusive on making the, the official film of the carbon dating. And the BBC, without any hesitation, commissioned it. Mm -hmm. And I, at, at, the at that time, 
the British Museum had Michael Tight, Dr. Michael Tight, who was the British Museum's representative, mm -hmm. had stipulated a set of protocols that that he felt were essential um, if the test was going to be uh, definitive. Mm -hmm. And th th then there were certain things that had to be in place. And one of those protocols was that as far as the laboratories were concerned, the test had to be done blind mm -hmm. so that um, it would be uh, samples would be taken and distributed to the laboratories, but they would not know which was the shroud and which was some other cloth. Right. So that ultimately, at the end of the day, the there could there could have been no bias one way or another. And I went to the BBC and, and I told them about this program. They said that's marvelous, mm -hmm. and stupidly perhaps, in order to gild the lily, perhaps I said the great thing is I said because it's going to be done blind we can announce the result of the carbon test at the end of the program. So hmm. not only do you get the film about the whole process, but at the end of the film, we will open the envelope as it were. Right. Right. And the BBC said, this is wonderful. This is, hmm. this is just great. And, 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 and so it went forward, but as I and I got into pre-production with it and was backwards and forwards with Turin with Luigi Ganella, who was the uh, the representative. He worked. He was a professor at the Polytechnic of Turin, but as a scientist, and he had des been designated because obviously the church weren't scientific. He right. he was in charge of it. But as you know, Italy is a series of city state, I mean, city right. states, you know, right. and, and of course, Rome was involved, you know, because obviously this was a something that was initiated by the popes, but the representative of the Roman uh, scientific contingency and, and Luigi Ganella Turin, these guys were starting mm -hmm. to fight over you know, Rome thought, well, look, you know, we're more important than Turin said, hang on, right. wait a minute, this is the shroud of Turin. And the right. result of that internecine, if that's the right word, mm -hmm. interregional squabble was one of the causes why, very human thing, you know, let's sure. just, you know, very human right. thing. As a result of this, these protocols that have been established fell by the wayside. So I had to go back uh, to the BBC and say, I'm sorry, but what I told you was that we were going to be able to announce the result. At the end, it, it's not going to happen. Um, and now this is, I've written about this in some detail. As you know, I, I was editor of the British Society for the Turing Shroud newsletter. Sure. Um, and in the last edition of this, I've, I've written about this in some detail. It won't surprise it won't surprise a Christian to know that there's a duality in the world. There is there's good and evil. Right. Um, and nowhere else did this become more evident in this whole process of dating the Turin Shroud. There was a, an individual who we now know from inception. Uh, if somebody who, who ingratiated himself with the whole shroud community, including the owner of the shroud, the exiled king of Italy, Umberto. Mm -hmm. And he posed as somebody, um, a great enthusiast for the shroud. But his hidden agenda was to make sure that the shroud would ultimately be proved to be a fake. Mm -hmm. Now, this one person got themselves right to the very heart of the whole carbon-14 test, totally um, by deception, by not allowing it. That we now I know this now, but at the time, 
his his whole assumption was he was he was somebody entirely only interested in the interest in the show, and um, he ended up being able to manipulate the uh, quite a few because he was right at the heart of the thing, and a lot of the things that went wrong with the with the carbon dating and there were several uh, owe themselves to this this uh, uh, there's only one word for it, it in, if, if, if you take the dualist view of the world there's good and evil mm. this was evil mm. that, that was working to do its best to make sure that the shroud of turin would not be uh, seen to be or, or, or proved to be like to be authentic i mean in italy yeah. I mean, in Turin, they, there were preparations because they were so, because of the massive evidence, they, were, they, they had such confidence. There were plans to build a monument in Turin that would rival Napoleon's uh, <laughs> monument in France. It was, it was really, um, uh, that was the, the sort of sense of, of, of positivity that there was, a, bearing in mind all the other evidence. Um, and then the other factor was that, um, it, naively perhaps, the church authorities assumed that science, its whole ethos, is one of strict neutra neutrality, you know, and, right. and it's, it's all down to pure experimental work. Um, and that turned out to be a very naive view because the world of carbon-14 uh, at that time was extremely competitive. There was right. a brand new carbon-14 process that had just been developed called the AMS process. And mm -hmm. um, up until it had been, that had been uh, established, um, in order to get a decent carbon dating, you needed this amount of material okay, right. that had to be burnt in yeah. order to get enough carbon. Well, under this new process, all you needed was that amount. Sure. So it was a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. And there were seven laboratories in the world who all invested heavily. Mostly they were departments of universities. Right. And they they were very they knew that whoever of these laboratories got to date the turin shroud and could show that they could do so definitively right would score an ex, a great commercial advantage because sure. it, it's a commercial business well, there's a lot of grant money in that too i would imagine uh, absolutely and yeah. um one of the characters who came into play was um, Professor Edward Hall, who was in charge of the Oxford Radio Carbon Union. Sure. And he was desperately keen to, he was, an, he was a patrician. He was a cat, he'd gone to Eton. He was, he was not unlike mm -hmm. Boris Johnson. I mean, he had mm -hmm. all of those sorts of patrician, Etonian characteristics. Sure. He was a, he, and in many ways, he was a lovely chap. There's lots of great things I could tell you about him. Mm -hmm. However, he was he was financing a lot of this Oxford radiocarbon unit himself, and it was draining on him. And he was oh, okay. also very anxious to retire. Kind of pr private investment, like he himself was was financing. Uh, he, he he was funding it himself. A lot. Oh, okay. okay. Um, but he knew he couldn't sustain this. Sure. And uh, as it happened, uh, he, because of the nature of the man himself, he had some very wealthy friends who said, well, look, Teddy, if, if, if you get to date the Turin Shroud, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put a lot of money into your lab because we'll know that it's going to be commercially successful and you can retire. Mm. But at that time, there was no certainty that Oxford would be chosen because there were only three labs that were going to do it out of the seven. Mm. So, and this is, this is where, and I, I, I've said this very openly, um, you'll have to make your own decision about mm -hmm. this. Um, and I've said it so openly and I've invited the, the person involved to, um, to sue me if he wants to. Um, but 
the British Museum had, had appointed Michael Tite, Dr. Michael Tite, who was the head of research, to supervise all of this. And mm -hmm. Teddy Hall, and Teddy Hall also, by the way, was a trustee of the British Museum at this time. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't only in charge of the laboratory in Oxford, he was a trustee of the British Museum. And, and there's no other way of saying this, to cut a long story short, he nobbled Dr. Michael Tite and said, look, I want to retire. If we are chosen to be one of the labs, there's no reason why you shouldn't have my job because I'm going to retire if I get this and you could take over the running of the Oxford lab. And it was an understanding between them. And sure enough, Oxford was one of the three labs chosen. And now this is the interesting thing. It wasn't Michael Tite's fault that these protocols that he personally had said had to be in place if you want to get an accurate test. It wasn't his fault that those protocols had in part had to be abandoned, some of them. Okay. At which point, if he had been uh, consistent with his initial saying, which is these protocols, you need those to be in place to get an accurate result, he would have said, we can't do the test. But because... Mm. He now had a personal stake mm -hmm. in the outcome of this test, and particularly the test going ahead. He said, oh, that's all right. Forget the fact that I said these protocols had to be in place. We'll do the test anyway, mm -hmm. and all will be fine. Well, What's, yeah. I mean, it, it, it really it seems like a pretty clear conflict of interest, <laughs> to say the least, you know, for sure. Absolutely from a, especially a scientific his... standpoint, for sure, if you're trying to be as objective and, like you said earlier, um, what was I forget the word you used? I'm sorry, but, you know, the neutral, you know, it's, yeah. uh, the, you know, we're, we're all human beings and those are the kinds of things that tempt us to lean, you know, maybe against neutrality a little bit, for sure. And sure enough, Michael Tite succeeded Edward Hall two months mm. after the carbon-14 wow. dating. Two months. Wow. Yeah. So oh this, this test... Mm. Now, I, I have a... <laughs> I, I can't remember exactly where it comes from, but somewhere in the Bible it says, do not put the Lord thy God to the test. Mm. Um, and... Uh, and I, <laughs> I, I never I, thought of it in connection with, <laughs> with the testing of the dating of the. That's fun to think about. Uh, it turns <laughs> out that I mean, if if the, if the carbon fourteen test had not been done, I assure you that on the, with the weight of the other evidence that existed, um, the shroud of Turin would be hmm. the most holy relic in Christendom, and Turin would have got exactly what it wants. You know, it, it would have become the centre of pilgrimages, which. In many ways, it still is, of course, especially in sure. Italy. Um, That's I, and I, I have to tell you, David, too. Like for every, not every video I post that has to do with the shroud, and this this channel, like I, I cover a lot of different kinds of things, but this uh, this subject tends to uh, bring in the most views. Which, quite frankly, one of the reasons I like to do uh, anything on the shroud is because there really does seem to be a tremendous interest in it, one way or the other. And I don't get a lot of negative comments it's mostly positive but the negative comments i do get i can't think of a single one i've ever seen that didn't basically just say this is nonsense that the the carbon dating is clear like nobody ever points out that they never go anywhere other than the carbon dating so i'm it's interesting you should say that that's been my experience too just seeing you know the naysayers sometimes on the comments <laughs> uh, but th there is another reason for that which mm. is more insidious and and I don't know and, and probably more difficult to overcome. Mm. We live um, not so much in America, but certainly in Europe. We live in a post-Christian era. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't have that. I hope you don't find that an offensive remark. No, um, it's I, I I see it every day here too. Things that seem pointing that way. Yeah. We, and, and one of the reasons for that is, um, you know, the, the 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 church the churches themselves have not done themselves any great favors. Sure. Um, the, the there are scandals, financial mm -hmm. scandals. 
I mean, my office and, uh, during the 80s overlooked Blackfriars Bridge in London and the head of the, of the Vatican mm. Bank was found hanging from that bridge. Yes. Uh, yep. One day when I looked out of my office window, mm. we've had the paedophile scandal. Mm -hmm. um, with the church doing, you know, actually now owning up to the fact mm -hmm. that it was remiss in so many ways. They, this is stuff sure. they tried to sweep under the carpet. So, unfortunately, you have a, a, an increasingly secular world mm -hmm. that says to itself, we don't want to go back to an age where the church mm -hmm. had such an authoritative position in our society um, mm -hmm. and there's no way of, of avoiding this but if the shroud of turin is authentic and is what any rational uh, open-minded person would recognize it can only be explained by some miraculous uh, process to leave that image mm. it opens up for some people a can of worms does right. this take us back to... Uh, so the resistance amongst intellectuals and the intelligentsia in particular, and even uh, the, cur the clergy um, at the highest level, they, there is a resistance to right. giving the Shroud of Turin, approaching it with an open mind, because where will that lead us? And sure. this is something that is 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 very difficult to overcome, um, and right. I don't know what the answer to that is. Well, how did this? So you know, this sort of turmoil, this situation, this you know, uh, uh, social and cultural climate. You know, how did really in the wake of the carbon fourteen situation, then you know, discoveries through the the 90s, early 2000s, like how did this uh, uh, Who Can He Be project develop, you know, or what, what brought you to want to do that uh, as sort of a, a follow up? If I don't know if that's the best way you'd put it, the follow up to who or uh, to the silent witness. How, how did that sort of have its genesis? Well, um, I, t I think I, two things. First of all, because of what I've already explained, well, three things, perhaps mm -hmm. um, my own personal exposure to it and don't, I told you that my uh, I started off my uh, with a passionate interest in photography spent hours in yeah. dark rooms I then went to the London Film School um, images are in my DNA mm -hmm. and when I look at the image on that cloth and the way that the the only way that and the, the three-dimensionality of it I can see precisely that I have absolutely no doubt in my own mind. The only thing that can explain that three-dimensionality um, is the fact that there was some release of energy from the body itself in a mm -hmm. way that nobody could possibly understand. And right. okay, it, it sounds, I know, it, uh, uh, and it, it sounds miraculous, and that's because it could only be <laughs> miraculous. Sure. Um, and... You've also got to remember that um, Christianity uh, really took off because the people who actually saw him dead and then saw him alive again right. died themselves rather than deny it. I mean, be, yes. they'd seen it. And, and no one can... How, how can somebody stick to their guns like this you know when they're going to be it's very strong evidence it, it, so many people just ignore that detail and it's, it, it's it wasn't just one or two people no, no. you know it's all of them <laughs> it just doesn't make sense exactly you know? so so and, and and that's what that's what started uh christianity right i mean and uh, i mean if 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 the if, if given the uh, the historical and the other evidence that we have, if the figure purported to be Julius Caesar um, or, or Genghis Khan or some, hmm. people would accept it as authentic straight away because of the, <laughs> the, the scientific evidence. Sure, but sure. Because it's the it, the moment you accept it as all, the image is potent. It's yes. potent because if, if it's authentic, it's a miracle, and that means 
the origins of Christianity are exactly what it says in the Bible is. And right. not a lot of people want to go back to that. There's a lot they at stake. They don't want to go back <laughs> to a world in which right. the church had both a moral authority and an intellectual authority. They don't mm. want that. It's very big resistance. Sure. Hmm. That makes sense. <laughs> So how, how did you approach this? And as, as I mentioned, I've uh, I've been able to see it. Uh, we're going to share all the links and everything here in the uh, – well, by the time anyone's seeing this or listening to it, you can see the links in the show notes below. Uh, I do want to, by the way, real quick uh, uh, pitch the website, which is just very simple. It's whocanhebe.com. I got that right, correct? I think that's yeah. – I've got it right here. Um, and and so I'd, there's like, a lot I'd, of, I'd, I'd like if I sure. could at this point. Oh, please, um, yes. Michael Kowalski um, mm. is somebody I've worked very closely with with this and he's the one who's created that website oh, okay. uh, for this project and also you'll uh, with within on the who can you be download of streaming download that you've got you've got his very uh, specific blow by blow account of what went wrong with the carbon 14 test oh, okay. and that's something that um uh, it, 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 in itself is ex is extremely powerful. Sure. So, uh, so how would you? I don't know if this is how would you differentiate in a sense that who can he be versus silent witness? Or maybe I should just ask, you know, what what do you hope uh, to communicate to people through specifically this this newest film, and and uh, what do you hope to see it, its effect be? Well, I'm I'm now seventy two. Um, and it occurred to me that we're only, uh, what is it? We're, we're barely 20 years away from the 2000th anniversary of the, yes. the event that caused this thing. Right. I, I, I have two reasons, um, f to, to, as it were, to do what I possibly can for the Shroud of Turin. Uh, I was a completely unknown novice filmmaker when Father Rinaldi took his trust in me and, and arranged, gave me basically the equivalent of a million dollars as an untried filmmaker to make The Silent Witness, which went on to win a British Academy Award and kicked off my career. And I had a then, if you go to my British Film Institute, page you'll see as a I went on to make a hundred films <laughs> um, and I owe that all of that hmm. to a hundred documentaries mainly uh, mm -hmm. I all of the, I owe all of that uh, it, it set my career off, off and enabled me to buy my f family a nice house mm -hmm. and gave me a good living so personally I owe I owe it a lot and I sure. also I Rinaldi, Father Rinaldi, at the his own parish in New York because of the carbon fourteen test. Um, and let me just tell you what when I when I I told you Rinaldi invited me over to America. Yeah. Um, I'd never been there before. He met me at the airport, and uh, we went. We he took me to his 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 presbytery. And he said, I'm going to take you now to where you're going to stay. And we walked, his presbytery was about, I don't know, uh, on the high street. And, 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 and we walked the length of the high street of Porchester, mm -hmm. which was his town. And it took ages because everybody he passed, they crossed the street and said, oh, fuck. You know, this guy was worshipped. <laughs> you know, it, it was... <laughs> I have never seen an individual so loved hmm. by his parish. And and then just to discover that the parish of Porchester was not just a church, but um you know, a lot of Catholic, most Catholic priests are moved from place to place right. after right. They, they wouldn't let him go. And <laughs> he he had a school, he had a community center, hmm. um, and as he, as well as building the shroud. Uh, he he built a, a, a special chapel for the shroud there. This man was absolutely loved in a way that 
if you could imagine that if you, whatever your whatever your concept of what the perfect priest might be hmm. um it would be him and uh <laughs> we finally got to the there was a brand new hilton hotel in portchester we walked in and we walked up to reception and and when I really said to the, this is this is my friend. He had a very. If, actually, if you were going to cast somebody in a mafia, you you. Yeah. This, he had this. <laughs> he had the accent for a reason. <laughs> right. Uh, this is my friend David Wall. He's called from London, and <laughs> uh, he's a friend. Of, and the manager said, Father and Alan, if he's a friend of yours, he's a friend of ours. He stays here for free. <laughs> um, this is a measure of. Of the man, so wow. I have two no devotions. I, 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 but because of the carbon fourteen test, when Father and Aldi eventually um, retired and died, the shroud was expunged from Porchester. Uh, everything that he'd done there um, was taken as uh, um, removed. Mm. There's some vestiges, is perhaps somewhere, but. And his memory and everything that he fought for. So I dedicated this film to him. Mm. So I, my motivation Beautiful. for doing it was I'm 72. We're only 20 years from the 2000th anniversary of the event that caused this. If I don't do something now, and I got, when I shot the silent witness, there were, I shot it in 35 millimeter and, and re religiously kept the negatives and all my moves over these years mm. in scans. And these, it's been scanned into 4K and it looks beautiful. And it there does. are some scenes in there that you couldn't reproduce. Sure. So that was a really very useful asset to have, yeah. uh, as well as the additional the additional filming. So you asked me why I have a debt of, a debt of gratitude to Rinaldi and, a def and, and, and for the, the wonderful things that happened to me because of this and a certainty of what I know about the carbon-14 test that at the very least it was done badly and at the worst it was done deceptively. Hmm. And uh, it's very difficult now to get anybody to open their hearts and their mind to the idea that that test um, was anything but authentic. Well, and one of the most compelling, uh, you know, I don't, don't want to give any spoilers away here, but uh, there, there are several compelling moments in the documentary for, uh, uh, for, for me, but I think, you know, one of the most, one of the most, you know, I mean, there's so many interesting, and I, I don't even know if that word does it justice. There's so many just, just thought provoking moments throughout it. And it always keeps coming back to this uh, invitation would be the way I'd put it, this invitation for whoever the viewer is to look into this themselves, you know, and, and to go beyond. And this, I, I see this with my own students who I introduce. I, I just have a little unit. It's, it's not a focal point of the course I'm teaching right now with my high school students. Uh, but I give them some of the basics, just, just a little window into to this whole world. And every time I do, every year I give them a survey at the end and they always rank this you know, uh, right at the top of, of the most intriguing, interesting, uh, thought provoking, uh, turn you upside down on your head kind of thing that we do all year. So I have great hope just from my own experience of seeing how the younger people react to this and to just see this face and to be asked that question really does seem to open up a lot of doors that maybe can't be opened otherwise. So that's for what it's worth. <laughs> my, my way of thanking you two for doing this, this work for this long as well. I'm, I'm I'm really pleased to hear it now. Uh, one of the things that I'm finding very pleasing at the moment is that um, uh, I mean, when when Hollywood makes a film, they spend even more on promotion than they do on the film itself. Sometimes, unfortunately, we're not blessed with that facility. But I have um, asked, uh, and I'm and I'm delighted to say that it is streaming, and uh, over a thousand people have now. Uh, downloaded it and uh, watched it, and, uh, and I can tell. I, I've asked people because Christianity itself started by people telling somebody right. about it, and then they told somebody else, and they told somebody else, 
and um, if what I'm hoping is is that, that that's the only thing they can explain it so far because they say the publicity I, I haven't been able to bump uh, bombard the press with advertising but you can tell that people who have watched it are telling people about right. it sure and it is it is slowly doing that and that's how christianity started of course too you yes know? yes people people started telling people you know only, only the very few were blessed to see the actual to witness the miracle itself but but they told people about it and mm -hmm. then it became what it is sure and well, as I was say, in, in 20 years' time, we'll have the 2000th anniversary of that event. So mm. that's what I, that's what triggered me, I think. I think it, yeah. it's, that's, now's the time. And it'll probably take 20 years. Who's to say? Like you said, too, he doesn't, he doesn't always seem to be in a big, big hurry. <laughs> and I mean, you see that all through the, the Old Testament, too, right? You know, how long Abraham has to wait for that promise. You know, God says, I didn't say when I was going to do it. I just told you I was going to do it. So, oh, but well, uh, David, I should probably let you go here. I know it's late for you there. I got to go make some dinner, too. So, <laughs> well, all I can but, say that but, is bon appetit. Oh, thank you. And, and thank you so very much for, for being here. It's It's a real pleasure to make your acquaintance. I definitely want to uh, keep in touch and, and um, I'll get those links as I uh, mentioned earlier to everybody here in the show notes and, and we'll do our part hopefully to spread the word so thank you so very much thank you a true delight honor real privilege to get to speak with David Rolf so uh, I am thrilled as you guys know uh, to ever investigate this more, to talk to people, get their shroud experience, uh, any uh, new information you know, in terms of new discoveries as they come up, uh, personal testimonies, personal experience, peeling sort of the layers back a little bit and, and taking a closer look at some of the issues with that 1988 carbon dating, uh, the art history. David mentioned a little bit about that with uh, Ian Wilson's work, and there's others who have done a lot of work in that regard that I'm hoping to talk to in the future as well. That's an area uh, that I uh, am, am becoming increasingly intrigued with, and uh, you will definitely be seeing more about that on the Gracious Guest Show in the future. So as always, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel, like the uh, video, share this far and wide, share information, uh, the links about uh, the Who Can He Be documentary as well. We really want to get the word out about that, as David was saying. And uh, thank you guys so much for stopping by. Couldn't do this without you, so God bless you. And until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care.